congratulations to the, the previous two presenters for some really uh, tech uh, filled presentations, really packed with detail and uh, very, very interesting applications of uh, software to problems. Um, you can have a little break from uh, high detail now. I want to provoke you with some ideas instead uh, and um, uh, give you some things to think about. Um, so, just for a, a weak provocation, the, uh, the, the title of my talk gives some idea of where I'm going to head with this uh, discussion. Um, I want to just take you first of all on a bit of a journey. So you're really excited, you've just been given a new job. Uh, you're the resource geologist uh, for a, a company called Blue Skies Mining. Uh, and you've been, you're new into the job, you've done the first couple of days of induction and you've been tasked with updating the resource estimate. Um, someone gives you the resource report and you open up the resource report thinking this is a great start. Uh, turns out it's only half finished and at this point you find out that the previous geo who had your role uh, apparently left rather rapidly under a bit of a cloud before they could repeat, uh, finish the report. So you, you do a bit of digging, there, there's a bit of geology in the report, it's actually quite well covered, but the resource estimation part's uh, a little lacking. So someone points you towards the directory on the server, uh, you open it up and there's a, uh, there's a zip file in there, so once you've found IT and got them to install the software that lets you see into zip files, um, then you, you, what are you encountered with? You, you uh, open the directory and you might have seen this or something similar earlier today. You have a mass of files confronting you. Now this is a software that you're not particularly familiar with. You've had some exposure to it, but you really don't know your way around it particularly well. Uh, so you go uh, and find the only person on site who apparently is uh, a gun user, and that's the surveyor. Um, <laughs> That helps you decipher what some of the files in the directory mean. Uh, they seem to occur in groups. You've got uh, what look like input uh, ASCII drill hole files, um, although perplexingly there's two sets of those. Uh, there's a bunch of binary drill hole files. There's a bunch of, uh, of composite files in there. Uh, you've got some binary block model files. Uh, one called CLS, which probably means class. One called uh, dot .dat, not quite sure what that means. And the other one called dot, uh, .temp. That's probably fairly typical. Um, there's a bunch of parameter files in there, uh, and these uh, appear to contain all sorts of, of input parameters to processes, um, and are the instructions for running the various uh, uh, underlying algorithms uh, to get from input data to populating block models. There's a bunch of, a lot of files in there which are, uh, appear just to be verbiage, output from the, uh, from the runs that have been created, um, which uh, are really only tagged by their date. You can't actually decipher too much from them. There's some report files, um, variably named, uh, and all in all, it's starting to look a little bit, uh, a little bit daunting at this point. So you dig into the, the directory that contains the geometries uh, and export those into a software that you're familiar with, pull them in, you translate the block model uh, and bring that in, and they're pretty close, uh, but they don't quite match exactly. Uh, and you quite, can't quite generate the same tons and grade reports as you're seeing in the report files, or all that appears in the resource table in the resource report. So at this stage, you're thinking, oh, where do we go with this? And uh, most people are probably going to throw up their hands and say, well, I'm just going to start again. Um, it's difficult to decipher from what's gone on in that directory, or sorry, from the material in the directory, what's gone on in there to actually you know, follow the process that was employed in creating the resource estimate. So. I want to just duck sideways here and just provide a very quick reminder of uh, the scientific method as applied to geology. So most people here are comfortable with the idea that a geological interpretation is a scientific hypothesis, uh, that we can test that hypothesis by uh, adding data to it, by seeing how well that, that hypothesis explains the new data, uh, and we either have to uh, modify uh, our, our hypothesis, uh, or with luck it, it, it uh, supports it and uh, will not falsify it. Um, or you can choose to ignore it or, or try and squash it into the existing interpretation if that's more convenient. So what's possibly less intuitive is that, um, or less obvious, is that a resource model is also a hypothesis. We start with data uh, and we apply choices, assumptions and decisions to a variety of applied scientific tools, applied scientific methods, in order to get uh, to a resource estimate. And similarly, new data tests our hypothesis. So with this in mind, 
keep, keep this workflow in mind, the idea that what we're trying to do with a, with a hypothesis is to falsify it. Uh, that's the key test of a, of a scientific hypothesis, is that it's falsifiable. Keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. Oh, actually, before we do that, one second. Um, in terms of resource estimates, the hypotheses that you're going to be encounter, uh, encountering are principally the one of stationarity. Um, so is the domain that you've chosen a, a, uh, going to meet the intrinsic hypothesis, which is what allows us to apply, effectively to apply geostatistics to real phenomena? Uh, the variogram model is a hypothesis that's closely related to the underlying idea of stationarity. Um, is the estimation method that we've chosen appropriate for the, the task at hand? Um, and are the, the, the estimation parameters within that method also appropriate? So let's just think about what the current paradigm for a large amount of resource estimation that's done is. Most software systems, are, you have a file-based architecture in which we uh, have input data files, uh, output block model files, uh, a set of commands or programs or executables that allow us to, to undertake various operations, things like compositing and, and uh, the, the uh, estimation, uh, to apply top cuts and to do sort of you know, uh, manipulations to our input data files, etc. cetera. Um, and parameters and uh, run files, parameter sets and run files that provide the instructions towards these uh, to, to, to enable these programs to run. Now, that, that's probably simplifying it a wee bit. Most software does have interfaces of some sort which enable you to, to follow the, the commands on screen to, 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 as a way of harvesting the input information to link the data files to the output files and, uh, uh, and input the parameters. But a lot of those are pretty clunky um, and quite limited. Uh, and I guess most people would recognize that it kind of, you, you earn your stripes as a resource geologist when you move beyond the interface and get your hands you know, uh, under the bonnet uh, and learn to, to be able to do things like write scripts because it makes the software useful. It's part of earning your stripes. Um, so there's some consequences to this style of architecture. First of all, um, the process is really dependent on good housekeeping practices, on making sure that, for example, you've got good documentation in place that lets people who come after you work out what was done inside that project. Um, consistency of things like naming conventions and paths is really important. Some of the software still have effectively DOS-based architecture, uh, or sorry, DOS-based hangovers, uh, 8.3 type file naming conventions. Um, the process is very dependent on external archiving uh, and zip files. I didn't show them in that previous directory. There's a bunch of zip files in there which are preserving the project or the input files at various states and various times, usually with a date stamp on them. Um, and what's really required is a high level of user skill in order to operate the software. So, do any of these things sound familiar uh, for anyone who's been involved in resource estimation directly, that you've overwritten a file, an error, an important file, one that you can't recreate or reproduce? that rotations have been applied incorrectly. Now, this has got easier over time as, as softwares have allowed you to visualize the ellipses, but uh, still rotation conventions, well, you know, I was a, a consultant for 10 years and it was bread and butter trying to decipher this stuff for other people. Um, syntax or logic errors uh, in, the, in the way that uh, the scripts have been written. Um, data entry errors, when you're compiling the scripts, you put a decimal in the wrong place or uh, make a typo. Uh, that the help files are not particularly helpful. Uh, and this is possibly showing my age here, that, uh, that the tech support is on speed dial in the phone on your desk. Now, most people don't have phones on the desks anymore, but uh, in the days when you did have phones on your desks, you generally had a pretty close relationship with the tech support people. And uh, you know, a sign of, of when you're doing your stripes again was when, uh, when you rang up, uh, you knew more than the person on the other end of the phone. So. I guess you're getting the idea that you need to be pretty good at running software. You need to be pretty good, good at things like scripting and have a detailed knowledge of how the software operates um, and be a bit of a guru in that regard. So what do you have to be? You need to be a bit of a wizard. Um, well, you can think of that another way. Um, it creates gatekeepers between or in the process of resource estimation. And, you know, I've, I've 
occupied that role. I like to think I was the guy on the left. So, you know, a good Gandalf, a wise mentor, a teacher, an enabler. Um, or, you know, I suspect there's a bit of the Radagast in me, a bit socially inept. Uh, happiest down among the weeds and the leaf litter and getting stuck into the details. Um, or do you have a Saruman in your organisation? Somebody who's brilliant but flawed. Someone who's uh, highly ambitious, enjoys playing the power games. You know, it was good for me, don't, don't get me wrong, but uh, really should being a wizard at the software be a prerequisite to being a resource estimator? So I want to pose this question again, just keep this in your minds as we go through the rest of the presentation. Where's the revolution required in resource estimation? First of all, let's have a quick look at some data. It's always good to go back to data. So here we've got a, some data that's been sourced from uh, RSC's Mineral Intelligence Database. First, I want to get the caveats out of the road. It took a bit of cleaning. Uh, that this isn't representative of the industry as a whole. RSC is uh, gathering data from public reports uh, based on, on people who are obliged to report under various reporting codes. Big companies are underrepresented in here. Uh, so any company such as BHP for whom a single operation is not material uh, don't have to report the details of individual estimates. But for the smaller mid-tiers, this is pretty representative, representative of uh, the current state of play in terms of estimation. So this is global, uh, 17 months worth of data between July 2016 and November 2017. Um, first thing to note is that fully 18% of estimates globally uh, reported using inverse distance methods or nearest neighbour. Possibly a little shocking. Just under 50% uh, are ordinary Krieg estimates. 30% uh, are not stated. Now, I did some digging here. I was a bit concerned about this figure. I sort of thought that maybe, maybe that's all the nonlinear estimates in there. Uh, but the ones that I went and checked weren't. They were either ID or ordinary Krieg in the vast majority of cases. There was some exceptions, and I know that there's companies out there who are using other nonlinear methods in MIK, which occupies 4%. But they're not represented in the public reports of, of small to mid-tier companies and some large companies as well. So the vast majority of estimates, I'd say north of 90%, probably 95% of estimates, are created using linear estimation methods. And linear estimation, again, there's a, there's a mystique about uh, resource estimation, which it is, it's a complex process. Resource estimation is, uh, and it requires things like the five years of uh, um, relevant experience to, to declare yourself as a competent person. That's five years of relevant experience in resource estimation, not necessarily in software. So, how about the rest, of, oh, sorry, if, if that's the rest of the world, perhaps these, these stats have been skewed by, uh, by those you know, North Americans who love their, their uh, inverse distance methods. And perhaps we're doing better in, in Australasia. So there we have the figures just for Australasia. So we're still 16, 17% of resources reported in Australasia are inverse distance. Fully 68% are ordinary Krieg. So what we do a lot better in Australasia compared to the rest of the world is declare what it is we were doing. There's only 13% where it's not stated. In actual fact, we're doing worse than the world average uh, for the number of non-linear estimates that are out there in the public domain. 3% of MIK uh, estimates are from MIK. Now, again, I know that there's some underrepresented estimates in here. I know that Boston, for example, has done LUC estimates. And those aren't necessarily being represented. Actually, I think they're outside this time window, so maybe they would be if we re-ran these stats. Anyway. Just to give you some idea of, this is setting the background for what we were thinking about when we started developing an estimation product. What is the market uh, doing currently and where should we be focusing our attention? So putting that in, in uh, the back of your mind, what if resource estimation software was easy and intuitive, was workflow based, was dynamic, didn't require scripting, taking out the gatekeeper? or at least taking one attribute of the gatekeeper away. So, again, the question, where's the revolution required? Which leads me back to the, the focusing questions that we posed ourselves back in 2015 about resource estimation and what we were trying to achieve with the resource estimation product. We wanted to overall raise the industry standard. 
we wanted to try and get people to do uh, to apply uh, estimation better across the industry, to reinforce the scientific basis to estimation, um, and to give geoscientists tools to make their job easier, following the ethos of what we applied to the development of geo. There were some uh, objectives that we set ourselves. We wanted to make, first of all, make existing techniques more accessible uh, and easier to understand, more user friendly, uh, and to remove the mystique from them. We wanted to modify the existing RBF technology to make um, it appropriate for uh, estimation. You may well be aware that, um, well, in fact, if anyone's interested, I'll send you a copy of the paper. Um, gave a, an address at the uh, Mining Geology Conference in Adelaide a number of years ago now, uh, explaining the basis to the RBF. Uh, and one of the reasons that we're less keen on using it in grade estimation for resource estimation is the behavior of that estimator uh, in extrapolation particularly. It's a global estimator which uses all data, uh, and in extrapolation it doesn't behave in the way that we necessarily want grades to behave compared to, for example, ordinary Cregan, which is local. Um, we also wanted to, or set ourselves the objective of developing new approaches around understanding uncertainty uh, and assessing reliability. So those are the sort of three big aims that we set ourselves. Now, good things take time. Um, so let's see where we've got to. Okay. The edge estimation product, um, or estimation module, uh, works around the concept of what we're calling a domain estimation object. So this is an object that links in the directory tree the domain uh, the data compositing and boundary uh, treatment, the variogram model for the data inside that domain, uh, what we're going to do about declustering, uh, the interpolation method and the basic linear interpolators are provided, uh, and the interpolation parameters and the search strategy. So the key thing, I guess, uh, one of the key advantages here is that the whole process is dynamic. If we add data to, uh, to a project, it'll flow through the geology, through the geometry, uh, into the domains, into the estimates. I guess I'll leave it to you to decide or you can give us feedback on how easy it is to use. There is no scripting involved, um, so implementation errors are eliminated in the process. It's highly auditable. The, 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 all the parameters and the what's been done in the creation of the, the block estimates are contained inside the object and contained inside the project. So, you're much less reliant on the process of housekeeping and uh, documentation in order to be able to decipher what's been done. You can pass a project across and somebody can understand implicitly what's been done inside that project. Um, at this stage, we have applied this to single domain. Okay, we've, we, a domain estimator is, um, uh, applies to a single domain only. You can use any geometry as an input to that. The first thing, the feedback we got when we, when we put it in the, in the world was when can we have, uh, that's, that's great. We like it. When can we have uh, scripting so that we can apply it to large domain sets and uh, you know, large numbers of domains and large numbers of objects? Um, okay, I guess, first of all, uh, we understand the, the objective of what we wanted, people want to achieve with, with having large estimates. I guess what we'd like to do is, first of all, encourage people to think about the, the process of estimation. Now, you know, if you're having to set up 250 domain estimate combinations, then it's going to take you a while. Um, but for the vast majority of estimates in the first place, it's a lot less than that. Um, we, we're working on uh, implementation of a, a multi-domaining solution, um, and I can assure you it won't involve scripting. Uh, so it will apply the same sort of user interface to, to solving that problem. We haven't, we're, it's a work in progress. Um, if anyone wants to, uh, to look at, I guess, the um, how to apply to a multiple multi-domain situation, multi-variables, Ian wrote a blog on this. It's there available on the website if you want to go and have a look. Um, next issue, version control. So you would have seen this slide or something similar to it earlier. Um, so Geo plus Edge uh, um, create resource estimations that are dynamic. Uh, Central allows us to publish those and to, uh, to version control the project uh, via Central. That also makes it accessible to collaborators uh, and accessible to a range of people who want to have or to, to access our resource estimates. So head office mining engineers, etc. cetera. Um, makes everything accessible, makes everything secure. So, that's, that's the solution that we've come up with for, for answering the key problems that we have or the key challenges around managing 
resource estimates. So just to show you, I guess, very quickly, the, uh, the dynamic nature of updating. Um, so you would have seen this data set already today a couple of times. Um, uh, what we're doing here is an update that involves about five years worth of drilling in one hit. Uh, but to give you the idea, um, the, this is actually set using a query filter at the, the drill hole level uh, rather than reloading the data, but the, the effect is, is the same, that uh, change the query filter and it flows through. Now this isn't live, but uh, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a rapid update. So just thinking back to the scientific method, um, what are we doing when we add new data? We're testing our existing hypotheses. How much, does it, how much sense does it make to redo the resource estimation um, workflow from first principles every time you add new data? How many times have you heard people say, uh, of, uh, we've, we've got new data on the, in the middle of updating the resource model, I have to redo the variograms? Two, three day exercise. You don't need to redo the variograms in many cases. The variogram is a hypothesis that you put forward and what you've done is tested that by adding new data to it. So on the left we have the, the base variograms, the, the variograms that were modelled on the base uh, estimate. Um, you can argue till the cows come home about how good that variogram fit is and how well that appropriate that variogram model is for that particular domain. That's a subjective choice based on experience. What you can't argue about is that if you update the data underneath it and the experimental changes and you compare it against the existing model, which is what's happened in the update, that that model didn't do, doesn't do a bad job of explaining the, the uh, data that we've now got available to us. Are you happy with that existing hypothesis? I would be. You could make some minor tweaks uh, if you wanted, and it's very quick to do that, but realistically what you've done is confirm the hypothesis about the validity of the variogram model you apply. So I guess one of the things that I've got in mind for the future is a traffic light system, some sort of uh, um, alert that says, okay, we've added data here, what objects within our, our estimation tree do we need to review uh, and, or check and review and, and either accept or move on? So that's, I guess, where we're up to with, uh, with Edge at the moment. We've got lots of really exciting stuff on the way. Um, I'm not going to highlight that now, so Byron's going to have a quick chat about the immediate roadmap uh, just before the break, next break. Um, uh, our immediate uh, intention is to continue building out the functionality of the resource uh, of the linear resource estimation method. We still have those uh, objectives firmly in mind that we want to think about how we modify the RBF to grade estimation and, we, and to provide access to uncertainty tools and uncertainty modelling. Those are guiding where we're going to take the product into the future. Thanks a lot, Mike.